ThatGreatBusinessShow.com is brought to you by De Facto Shaving Oil, the best anyone can get. Made in Ireland, sold worldwide. Welcome to ThatGreatBusinessShow.com podcast. This is our second edition recorded on the 1st of October, 2020. And thank you so, so, so much to everyone who was so kind to say nice things about us, about the show, and about the return of Team GBS. Team GBS is the team you join when you back us. In return, we'll back you and your business. Just get in touch with us. You can get us via the website, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. And because he told me to do it, we're also on TikTok. That he is my co-host, business coach, business investor, <laughs> and rugby legend, Jamie Heaslip. Hi, Jamie. And we were planning that great business show. I said I'd like you to give one short pithy, that's P-I-T-H-Y, piece of advice that you learned on or off the pitch that you think every business owner should adopt. So what's your, Jamie's thought for the day? Have healthy paranoia. What the hell? <laughs> what does that mean? What that means is what makes you competitive today doesn't necessarily mean you'll be competitive tomorrow. So always have a pipeline of what's going to give you a competitive advantage and be paranoid about the others. And if you want to know or learn more about that, you'll have to hire Jamie, the business <laughs> coach. Thank you, Jamie. So for coming up, we have old ways of making new dough. We have one of BBC TV's actual apprentices, why your sports club should think of being a co-op. And with the Supreme Court ruling on what is and isn't bread, we look at other VAT or VAT anomalies. But first, a word about our sponsor. Our podcast is backed by De Facto Shaving Oil, an all-natural and sustainable shaving oil created and manufactured in Mayo and sold online to the world. It is the best anyone can get. You all know the rules. Whoever backs Team GBS gets our backing in return. So next time it's time for a shave, think De Facto. Buy it online now at DeFactoShave.com. I use it myself and I love it. Our first guest on ThatGreatBusinessShow.com <laughs> this week was an actual apprentice on the BBC show last year. Pamela Laird used the publicity she got from the show to promote her own beauty products business Moxie Loves, which is growing like mad, especially through Amazon and Ocado. I'm told that Moxie Loves is at the forefront of emerging trends as the brand is designed to make travel, beauty, simple, fun and affordable. Pamela Laird, welcome aboard Team GBS. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So we excited. We only ask the hard questions about business. <laughs> what everybody wants to know about is Alan Sugar. What's he really like? What's he really like? That's the biggest question I get asked. <laughs> Funny enough, uh, we only ask the obvious questions. Here. I know. I think um, he's exactly as he comes across. Like, ex he, there's no acting with him, but he doesn't waste any time. So he's not there. Like, he's not behind the scenes chatting to the candidates or anything like that. He literally just shows up, does what he does and leaves. And is he Alan, Mr. Sugars, Lord Sugars to you or oh, your worship, your honour? Well, off camera, we call him LAS. So Lord Alan Sugar, that's like, what we'd say to each other. But like to him, it's yes, Lord Sugar, like hi, Lord Sugar. You know, that's what we say. So yeah, Lord. Fantastic experience. Huge yeah. branding for Moxie Loves. It absolutely was. It was one of the biggest risks I took in my business ever because I may have been kicked out in the first week. I could have come across terribly. Also, if I made it far, I was gone for 10 weeks, like 10 weeks, no email, no access to my business for the entire time. It was like filming Big Brother. And how were you chosen? So I, I went over for an audition and I just thought, sure, I'll see what happens. Hang on a second now, before the audition, because people want to maybe get yeah, on to do how, it how did you like, what made you go, I'm going to do that? You know, it was one of those things. I did Dragon's Den in Ireland a few years ago and I turned Which down... Which is better, Dragon's Den or Apprentice? <laughs> the Apprentice, for sure. <laughs> um, but I think... The, I did when I did Dragons Den. I turned down the Dragons after the show because it just wasn't the right deal, and I sort of kept going. I never really got to scale without that investor, so I was really looking for cash. I needed cash, and I was saying it to one of my friends, and she said, "What about The Apprentice?" And I was like, "I actually had never, I never watched a series." And I said, "Look, send me the application when it comes out, and I'll think about it." So she sent it to me, and I was like, "Sure." I just sat on the couch, applied, yeah. got accepted for an audition, and went, and that was like the most whirlwind day of all time. It was intense, seriously intense. What, did, what were you asked or asked to do? The first thing you were kind of like hurdled in with like 20 people, you stood in a number and they called your number at random and said, sell yourself in 15 seconds. 
And then they didn't tell you if you made it through. They just called your number, moved you on, put you in a lift. You went upstairs and you were like, oh, am I So what was your cell? I have no memory of what I said. I swear it was like a blur. I think I just said, hi, I'm from Ireland. If you'd redo it, (laughs) give us your elevator pitch. Go. Okay. Um, My name is Pamela Laird. I'm 30. I have a cosmetics brand that's launched into Boots. Like to me, that's just enough. But I didn't have that at the time. So I think I might have said something (laughs) along those lines of Primark. I don't know. (laughs) And why the word moxie in moxie loves? Because other people, and I know you don't agree with me on this. Yes. Moxie is a rhyming word with poxy. That's right. Poxy is not a great term in Ireland. That's true. However, moxie. You've got lots of moxie. I have lots of moxie, lots of sass. Get up and go. He's old. He's, yeah. That is the problem. It's a different generation. But of course, you're not selling to me, are you? No, and it is trtranslingual, you know. (laughs) No. I wanted um, I wanted a short name, something that you could write down. You'd know exactly how to spell yeah. it if you heard it on a podcast on the radio. Ah, smart. And in the dictionary, moxie means if you've got determination or drive, then you've got moxie. You have a bit of sass, a bit of get up and go. So here's a question on on the branding side of things, right? Yeah. Um, you know, obviously The Apprentice was big and it was a big punt and, and um, you use that to scale. Um, I'm curious about w- what the deals that were put on your table from the Dragon's Den and why you turned them down in terms yeah. of giving up parts of your company. But in terms of branding, being on an Amazon, being on an Ocado, handing over a lot of data to them mm-hmm. uh, regarding your brand and that product line, how does that sit with you or is it kind of a necessary evil? Like, why wouldn't you go, I know we were talking offline about your a virtual office now. Yes. Why wouldn't you just go B2C anyway now? Yeah, I mean, it's a huge strategy for us going forward, but I do feel like B2C is a really specific category that you nearly have to prepare for as a side of your main business because I suppose you get notoriety, you get a lot of kudos for being on the shelf in boots. So a lot comes with being stocked in the big boys, but obviously the margins are far better online mm. direct to consumer. But I do feel like personalization is key. And so in my business plan, as I still search for my correct investor, there's a huge element of the business that I want to develop within B2C. So customization, you know, selection, like quizzes when you go on, getting something that's customized for you, I think is so big in B2C, but it does require a lot of cash. And so the reason I went the other way was because I had the contacts. I knew retail a lot more than I knew direct consumer. So it's part... Where where did you get those contacts? Um, It's sort of like, I think when you're in the industry, like I'm in beauty. So I knew a lot of um, marketing people, let's say within boots, for example. Um, So you kind of just get people's names and it's like, look, it's not the easiest thing to get listed, but I knew what would work on a shelf because my mum had had a beauty salon. So I knew what sold well. Um, And I think getting somebody's name and cold calling them is all I did. I I didn't know them personally, but having those contacts, getting into Primark and then going, well, I'll definitely get into boots and then getting into boots. It's easier for me because I know it, um, but direct consumer is on my list. When so so you played to your strengths. Yes. Sorry, Colin, yeah. you, you, you leaned into your strengths heavily and yes. doubled down on them. And so what is your secret super strength going forward? I think it's, I think determination because we've, I've been quite resilient in business. We had like our, our hero product discontinued overnight with EU legislation. We had to get rid of it. And, you know, it would have been really easy to just fall and fold and think, God, what am I going to do? But actually, I think to just keep coming back and keep fighting and the creativity, you know, the innovation, mm. that's what I feel is our business and, and, and me. So when I meet a buyer, I think that they believe in me and my brand and they believe in the vision. So it's probably a bit of me, a bit of sales, you know, mixed together. Going back to what you were saying there about finding the buyers and making the cold calls. Yeah. Once upon a time, I was a sad stockbroker that has to make had to make cold calls. Not easy. It get my is violin out here for you. <laughs> it's awful. But you still did it. I still did it. And I was creative. You know, I had like Marissa Carter, for example, like she was a big inspiration to me and she came from the beauty background. So she had a beauty salon first. And I always felt like she gave me some great advice. You know, if you don't hear back from them, send them a box of donuts. And I was like, genius. Just sent the buyer don- box of donuts. Like, Pam, I'm so sorry. I meant to get back to you. Yeah. Listen, here's the PO, ready to go. You know, it's like not that easy, of course, but just sometimes having a bit of a personal touch. And that is a lovely one good tip. Give me two more tips. Um, again, personalization, because with our boots strategy and super drug strategy, I gave everybody personalized items with our logo on it, with their name on it. And I think definitely a personal touch when you're dealing with buyers um, because they're people too. And, you know, mm. it's up to them. It's They're taking a punt on you. And so rewarding them is always not bribery, of course, but just yeah. nice little touches. Um, and then my other tip, would be to, I really love the saying, feel the fear and do it anyway. Because if you're not scared, I feel like it's probably not the right decision or it's too boring or safe. Like yeah. get scared. And then that's when you know you're on the right track. 
It's That's like, how Jamie feels about that great business show. But it's yeah. like a stretch goal, isn't it? It's, it's like just, you know, get it a little bit out of reach and, yeah. and, and go hard after it. And like, if it's not scary, it's... Yeah, it's not going to be It's probably fun. too easy. Yeah. yeah, it's too easy. Exactly. So therefore, what's the big vision? What is, where will Moxie be, say, two years time? I was literally putting our mission statement together and I really feel that I want to be, glo- like everything I was saying was real cheesy, but it's so true. I want to be global. Like, you know, the industry, I don't know if you're aware, a lot of brands are being bought out by the bigger players. And that, it, to me, would just be such a huge sign of success. I don't want to sell my brand. It's my baby. But I know that if a big brand came knocking, I'd be doing on the right track, you know, that mm. I'd be disrupting the market a little bit. And you're looking for money. I'm looking for money. What kind of money? As in green folding stuff, I know. Well, why did you say why did you say no to the money in the first place off? Um, to the dragons, it was very restrictive. And okay. to be honest, like our minimum order quantities when we're doing stock would be the whole investment that was being offered. And I would want it there and then. Yeah. Whereas it was being drawn down in dribs and drabs. And that to me just it wasn't it just wasn't yeah. feasible. So do your pitch. See whether a team GBS will give you some See, money. You well, I, I have a few past, people. You know. I'm, Hold on, we'll oh, have you? Check the pockets <laughs> here, Connell. <laughs> I have a few people interested since The Apprentice, of course. It was such a huge yeah. opportunity. People were like, why didn't Lord Sugar invest in you? Let me see your business plan. So I've, I've been really lucky in that sense. So there's a few people knocking and interested. But um, really what I'm looking for is to scale. You know, we have like, we have a deal with China just about to, you know, come Take across on. the line. And it's all these deals that could like bankrupt me, basically, you know, because they're so big yeah. that they're almost too big. Um, and I'd hate to miss I mean, I was going to jump in there though, like in terms of, of, of the type of financing you want though. Yeah. So do you want equity financing or debt financing or do you particularly care? I mean, I, I would like equity because I'm, I've no co-founder, so it's just a little me. So it would be nice to get a you strategic. You seem like a powerhouse though, and that's not a problem. <laughs> I'm spinning plates, Jamie. There's a lot of plates going. Um, but I feel like a strategic investor would be lovely. Someone just with a bit of experience in scaling and export markets, because it would be nice to have someone who came with a nice contact book as well. Okay, yeah. So therefore, how much are you looking for? I'm looking for 250,000. Okay. Starting That's round. doable. Okay, so you got you got it there now. <laughs> I, you would be surprised who listens to that great oh, business show. Great. Dot com. What a, a big concern will be yes. that you said that that could go into one big order. What's like if it if something horrible did go wrong? What's plan B? Sorry, let me take you back. The Dragon's Den offer was fifty thousand euros, so that could be just an opening order, oh, let's say. Yeah. So, um. Like, I just feel like if it's not, if it's, it's a risk, of course, but the beauty industry is booming. You know, the lipstick effect has happened in a sense, you know, with recession, people go for certain trends. And I think you'll see it in beauty. Self-care is on the increase. And yeah, with a direct consumer arm of the business, it's it's really scalable. And I, I think that, you know, having a, a product every two to three months, it's, it's a fast paced industry. It's what's needed. And that's what you're doing. Are you blending or creating one every quarter? Or Yes. That... Like, yeah. I mean, that's how I see scaling because, you know, we're on booth shelf. We have two SKUs right now. Like we should have eight, you know, and then we would have the whole okay. shelf. So yeah. that's how I see the brand growing, bringing out products that are of the moment trend driven. And you are also aiming at the US of A. Yes, I am. How, who, when? I want Ulta. <laughs> like I want it. And I think based on where we're stocked so far, like we're we're about to do a deal with Rossmans, which is part of AS Watson, which is one of the biggest retail giants. You know, they own Superdrug and plenty of mm. others. So having those big names gets you the other big names because they mm. see that you're there and that's a, a ticked box. So that, like what I was saying earlier, why we didn't do direct to consumer, it's just been kind of the way we've grown. That focus seems to really be paying off on you and, and knowing exactly kind of the niche and how you yeah. want to scale it and grow it and using your super strength going forward. And yes. I mean, I'm excited. Uh, at the, Are you in? I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, sure. You never know. You never know. He's the investor. Yes. That's why he's here. He, uh-huh. just, he understands that side of the business. Yeah, and it well, is different. Pitch to, go on, go on. <laughs> no, but it's funny, like off, the, off Pointy, you, you see, like Pointy ended up capturing 1% of the retail market in the US. Um, but you see... You, you see you see this kind of challenge though between the the, the direct consumer online model yeah. versus going through retailers and mm-hmm. and how corner shops are are battling against the Amazons of this world and and like kind of Google are battling for the corner shop Amazon are kind of going out on their own and yeah. everyone's in the middle and it's really interesting to see how players like yourself come into it and decide which way to go yeah and I think you can go both I really do final question. Mm-hmm. If somebody wants to give you that big fat check, yes. where will they find you? They'll find me at, well, on, on my website, moxieloves.com, and you'll get me there. Or you can contact me on my Instagram, Pamela Laird, or LinkedIn, Twitter, I'm everywhere. And you also, there is a repeat, is there, of The Apprentice coming up 
So it's actually best bits. So they're going to highlight the best bits. So how I know, you know I'm in it. How do you know you're in the best bits? Because Thomas, if you didn't watch it, Thomas Skinner offered to take my place like an absolute gent that he is. And that has never happened in 15 years of filming The Apprentice. So I, I do know that that's making it into the best bits. And the second thing is that you are involved with one of the women's networks. Yes, I am. Local Enterprise has been massively supportive to me um, throughout my business and they're developing a, a separate section for National Women's Enterprise Day, oh, but they great. have supports right across the board. So I'm so happy to you know, shout them out to any small business. Just look, they have cash. They're giving it, especially the trading online voucher. It's two and a half grand, easy to get for businesses. Pamela Laird, Moxie, thank you. Thank you. We'll take a quick break. It's all go like Chrissy Gno on thatgreatbusinessshow.com. That great business show. Ireland doesn't have a tradition of having its sports club sponsored by shakes, oligarchs or zillionaires. And that means that during this COVID crisis that whatever paltry takings many clubs have at turnstiles or at weekly draws during so-called ordinary times, that in these extraordinary times, many clubs, even those that are usually relatively solvent, are now more than likely facing into the financial abyss. For this and for other reasons, members of clubs have to be very careful as to what their own personal liability is. And that will depend on whether they're shareholders, ordinary club members, or maybe members of a co-op. And there's new proposed legislation around co-ops aimed at bringing some of the co-op structures into the 21st century. That could mean people taking a fresh look at co-op structures, their attractions, and their sometimes cumbersome structures. And here to tell Team GBS why it's worth checking out those co-ops is one of Ireland's top young up-and-coming commercial lawyers, Kean Turkin from law firm Flynn O'Driscoll. You no turned, pressure, Keen. You turned away from the <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure if I, if you'd find many people to agree with that, but sure, let, let's go with that. Keen, what are the proposed changes, and you know what do they actually mean? 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 So I suppose you, you touched on it there. It's like at the moment, the legislation that's in place is is very cumbersome. Um, you're talking about the the legislation dates back to 1893. And there's a number of amendments as well. Uh, recently, obviously, you would have had the uh, the consolidation of the Companies Act in 2014, which, you know, managed to consolidate all of the underlying legislation, which dealt with private limited companies and, and, uh, and other company uh, structures. But we haven't had that for co-ops yet. Why were the co-ops left behind? I suppose they're, they're a different animal as well. Um, they're, you know, they, they are for a different purpose, although... There would be a lot of similarities between co-ops and and some types of uh, you know uh, private limited companies as well. But I think it was it was you know they they have always been provided under different legislation. So it was you know obviously felt that it had to be provided for in different legislation going forward. Well, what would be the like co-ops fascinate me? I I I I'll give you full disclosure. I don't know a whole lot about them, if anything, right? So what's the top line difference in purpose that you allude to from a, a PLC or a, a primary living company and a co-op? Well, I suppose the main purpose really is that, you know, for your private limited company or your PLC, you're talking about trying to maximise profits. Um, and, uh, you know, it is really driven and dictated by, you know, this drive for more profits, really. Whereas for a cooperative, it's really all for the benefit of the members. So it's, you know, an enterprise that's controlled uh, and owned by the members and it's run and operated for the benefit of the members. So you'd see that in the likes of the dairy and the agribusiness co-ops. So so what, they get they get a better share of sales or that they have more bargaining power or, or is, are they yeah, kind of so, both the same thing? So in, in terms of, say, the agribusiness, you'd have, say, rather than the um, the dividends that are paid to the uh, the relevant members, it's not dealt on the amount of shares that they would have in the relevant co-op. It's more dealt with their participation and their engagement in the, you know, what they economics. put in. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. wow. Okay. So, so the business that they do directly with the co-op, then they benefit in a proportion of that and would they, than their shares. Would it, is it, is it kind of like shares, but would they, in terms of voting rights then, how does that get panned out? So traditionally what you would have in the, you know, the model rules of a co-op, you would have one vote, for one member, regardless of how many shares that member actually has in the co-op. Hmm. Now, it is possible to, you know, provide for uh, other rules, but, you know, that would be the traditional model that all co-ops would follow. And that caused a lot of problems over the years, didn't it? Because I'm doing more action with the co-op and you're not. 
and yet you've got the same voting as me. Exactly, exactly. Like, you know, if you if you were a, a small farmer with a, a tiny plot of land mm. and your neighbour had, you know, 10 times the plot of land, you know, he still has the exact same mm. say in the running of the co-op as you do. And, and, it, and it can also become a bigger issue where people just stop engaging and stop participating in the co-op unless you've provided in the rules that you lose certain rights, then you still maintain your, you know, okay. equivalent say. I've ke- I keep on these new proposals, keep seeing mention of sports clubs. Go through that with me because, uh, I, like, you're not going to make any money in sport in Ireland, really, are you? Not really, not really. And I suppose, you know, there's there's a lot of things in, in terms of football, which is, you know, my main interest. You see, you know, there's, there's a lot of struggles with the League of Ireland clubs, um, and, you know, from if we step, take a step back and look at a more community based level, generally they're run as unincorporated associations, which means that, you know, they have to have their insurance in place. But that insurance might not be as robust as you would, you know, you would want it to be. And that that can then have a knock on effect of the trustees in the um, in the sports club itself. So they could be potentially made liable. personally liable. Yeah. So from that point of view, you know, it would make sense to incorporate um, in one manner or another to ensure that you can avail of the limited liability. So that's kind of, that's a, I think a key, you know, benefit from the likes of cooperatives or if it's your, you know, private limited company, uh, limited by guarantee. So what would, here's an interest for, for, for GAT clubs, rugby clubs, hurling clubs, athletic clubs, soccer clubs, it doesn't matter what type of clubs. Would you, could sports uh, clubs of, of of different sports come together or would they have to, would it be easier for them to be all the GA clubs start a co-op, all the football clubs that are, you know, and so mm. on and so forth? I, I think probably what you're you're looking at first of all would be, you know, an indi- at an individual club level because, you know, from, you know, working with, the, you know, the committees on smaller clubs and things like that, you'd see there's a lot of, you know, disagreements that can arise between, you know, people from the same community. So if you're if you're trying to, he's a born politician. Right? <laughs> yeah. So so if you can imagine trying to bring several clubs from the same locality together and trying to get them to unify in one voice, I'd say that would be quite difficult. But from a cooperative point of view as well, you can have secondary or federal cooperatives, which would mean the the cooperative itself, uh, their members are also cooperatives underneath that, rather than individual members. So in in that regard, you could have say, uh, like a normal cooperative has to have at least seven members, whereas a secondary or federal cooperative can have two members, but both of which need to be a cooperative themselves. Ah, uh, yeah, so okay, it can spread is, out like tentacles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This advice would cost you about 2,000 quid a minute. So I hope you're taking your notes there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, back to the co-op and the protection it gives to, uh, say, go back to your League of Ireland club. What protection will it give me and why? why haven't they done it yet? Or is it because of these proposed changes, might just make it easier? Well, so Sligo Rovers Football Club are actually a cooperative um, and Dundalk were previously a cooperative. It's relatively easy to to convert from a private limited company to a cooperative and vice versa. Um, so Dundalk were previously a limited company, converted to a, a cooperative and then converted back to a private limited company years before they were taken over by uh, the American company uh, Peak Six Sports. So at the moment, it's just uh, Sligo Rovers that are the cooperative, but Bohemian FC have a, a kind of a hybrid model in that they have, it's a company limited by guarantee, and uh, which means that it doesn't have any, any shareholding. So rather than um, having shares in the company, there, there are members and each member has one vote as well. So okay. that's, a, that's a kind of a hybrid model. Now, I know lawyers love giving on the one hand, on the other hand, answers. Mm -hmm. What is their definitive answer to this? What is the best model for a League of Ireland, because we'll stick with League of Ireland on this one, a League of Ireland club that you would recommend? So I suppose at the moment, it's, it would be difficult to to fully recommend the cooperative model until this new legislation is put in place. For one reason, there's uh, the audit uh, exemption, which is available to small and medium pri- sized uh, enterprises in Ireland, uh, is not available to cooperatives. So that can be a prohibitive enough mm. uh, expense for smaller enterprises. Uh, but hopefully going forward, you know, with this uh, new legislation, which should make it more readily understandable 
and just a bit easier to navigate, it will become a more attractive model for, you know, other clubs to adopt. I, I think the kind of benefit of the cooperative model for the likes of League of Ireland clubs in particular is that it's really community focused and it's, it tries its best to, you know, engage the members and to, to make it more beneficial for the members. And, and really that's kind of, you know, something that I think is, you know, could clearly benefit the likes of the League of Ireland teams and their communities as a whole. And so, keep the trustees out of trouble. Exactly, yeah. yeah. The most important thing. The, limi- the limited liability is most really Most of those trustees, like for all the different clubs, are volunteers, I'm guessing. And, and exactly, they're doing it for yeah. the love of it. And they might not necessarily be the experts in, in certain things. Yeah. So that's, yeah. I mean, my book, that's only good, right? Yep. Yeah. And, and even just on that point as well, there's the representative body for uh, co-ops in Ireland, uh, Irish Cooperative Organisation Society. Um, they actually, if, if you pay a membership fee and they can give you assistance and can help you with training and developments to, you know, uh, I suppose, improve on your abilities around, you know, governance and and running a business or a quasi business. Um, so, you know, there there is a lot of assistance there. Uh, which is, you know, a, an additional benefit to availing of the cooperative structure. Keen Durkin from Flynn O'Driscoll. Anybody who wants to find you will find you at FOD.ie, is that correct? That's correct, yeah. And his name is Keen with an I father, Durkin. That's the one, yeah. Keen yeah. Durkin, thank you so much for joining us on that <laughs> great business show.com. Thanks very much for having me, guys. You're listening to That Great Business Show with Conal Moron and Jamie Heaslip. That Great Business Show.com. That great business show.com is brought to you by de facto shaving oil. The best anyone can get. Made in Ireland, sold worldwide. Everybody in business wants to make dough, and those in the dough business want to make bread. That is, to turn a profit. If there are winners in business during COVID, bread makers are amongst them, as there's been a really big upsurge in bread making and a recognition that the humble loaf deserves greater respect. In 2018, Bread 41 founder Owen Klusky launched an organic bakery with a flour mill on site and a 44-seat cafe on Dublin's Pier Street. But, of course, the last few months have seen some radical changes to that business. We are recording that great business show.com in the late afternoon. So be kind to Owen Klusky, who joins Team GBS now, as he's been working today from 2 a.m. You've already done a 14... <laughs> you just rolled through from last night. So I did. 15-hour day already. And there's, there's still more to go. There's never <laughs> enough, as, as my dad always said... Uh, any hour before sevens were three after. So is that uh, just the life of a baker? It. Well, it is the life of a baker, definitely. But um, it's uh, it's great. Yeah, I really enjoy it. I actually prefer the the five to six hour. That's my favorite hour of the whole day. It's just where the tell comes. the world about the business Bread Forty One because when I was chatting to you earlier, I was taken aback by the size. I thought you were small artisan. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, well, the world artisan and small comes from, I suppose. Well, we we make everything in small batches, so it's not we don't do ten thousand loaves about a day or anything like that. Um, it's 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 not small. It's a, we've got a team of twenty four behind it, um, which is great. Um, it's difficult at at the moment now because we're with COVID, we're working in different pods and stuff like that. But um, it's great. Yeah, it's uh, very very simple. It just takes three days to make. So from start to finish, your loaf of bread will take three days. Um, it sounds a lot of time. But and and then you are up against Brennans and Cambridges and Bolands Who? and uh, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Well, you know what? I wanted to jump in here, right? Because <clears throat> I actually used, uh, in terms of, I, I used the analogy of baking bread um, for how you get into a state of flow or how to get into your your best state for performing, whatever that performance is, right? And you say it just takes three days. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's a lot of preheat in the oven yeah. to use a metaphor there. You know, what, what's, you know, what takes you to plan? What, what's, what's behind you preheating the oven to just, you know, there's more than just three days there. Yeah, well, there's time. So we initially with bread, we'll take um, flour, salt and water, the simple three ingredients, and we, we mix them together. And we add a, a culture of mother to that, which is um, everything works through fermentation. So to allow a bread to take three days, it, it, we mix the dough. It takes anywhere from two to five hours. It goes into a cold room. When we put that to a cold room, we're just telling the dough to slow down take your time but with time comes flavor so we have to stop looking at at adding elements to something to taste good anything can taste good if you just put tons of whatever in it to make it taste good but getting natural flavors from three simple ingredients is 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 the key to any baker and um, to make real bread 
And that's where the time element comes. So if it starts, if you want bread on a Wednesday, it starts on a Monday. Now, it sounds difficult and everyone runs away from it, especially home bakers. But if you can just put it into your schedule, it's like five minutes on a Monday, five minutes on a Tuesday, you have a loaf of bread or two loaves of bread or three loaves of bread on a Wednesday. That's depending on to yourself. So you can bake once a week for all your bread a week. Um, well, where, where, where did this love come from? This love came from, I, this in an early age. Or is it, is it a love <laughs> or a curse? Uh, no, it's, um, <laughs> it's definitely love. It's, uh, I think anyone connected with food or involved in food, it's definitely love. And I always say it's instilled since an early age. Um, I grew up in a bakery. My nana was a baker. Um, it was from old school plated apple pies. And um, I suppose that got instilled in me from a young age. And um, I went to school, did my leaving cert, became a carpenter. So I was like, oh God, I think I've taken the wrong path. But listen, I was young and I could earn lots of money then and I traveled and basically from traveling, I fell back in love with food, which the long story short, um, I found, started cooking abroad and um, came home into the bad snow in 2010 and said, right, I'm going to make a go at this, um, which led me to Ballymaloo Cookery School. Um, so I spent a bit of time down there and then just went back, just started baking and just kept baking. And I suppose in, in the weirdest way, I, I manifested. I said, one day I'll have this uh, bakery in Dublin with a stone mill and a, and a wood fire oven in the window and just kept focused and kept doing it. But uh, a lot of long hours and hard work behind that. But that's the love. And anyone I genuinely who cooks or is in food, it is the love that gets them there and, and from a young age. You said long hours. I mean, yeah. you honestly were up at 2 a.m. this morning, were you? Yeah, well, like a lot's changed since obviously with the COVID situation at the moment where... Um, I was sort of at the stage of the business and, and starting, I've been a startup, we were two years old in September and um, that the bakery, I was getting out of out of the bakery a little bit and not baking as much as I liked. And now it's sort of hands back on, you know, you're in there and um, I'm driving the van through deliveries. I'm I'm doing anything that helps the business um, um, to, to, to get where it needs to get to. So that's what I'm doing. Yeah. And what is the model for delivery? For example, are you, do you just do Dublin? Do you do Greater Dublin? Yeah, well, so we have a couple of wholesale accounts um, that we work with really close, like-minded cafes and restaurants. And um, we look after those guys and we've always had them. Um, and now we did some home deliveries and stuff during COVID and people have started to want to get out of the house. So we've sort of pushed that back to one day. Um, but people still come by the hatch and we're still serving through the hatch and... Fresh and bread. the brand, you have to brand it because I must need, I must, I need to know what your brand is, obviously, to yeah. buy it. Yeah. So it's, 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 the brand is Bread 41. Yeah. So where's, where's the name come from? Bre um, it was always very simple, Bread 41 Pier Street. Very simple. <laughs> <laughs> it's not rocket science. Actually, it's the site. So yeah. like you, if you, if you had seen it, it's like under the dark train, yeah. uh, the bridge going over Pier Street and you would have, most businesses would have gone, oh my God, well, we don't want this dart line going yeah. over it's rattling so mm. how did you arrive well, there? The, well, the, well the building it was actually lying empty for I think eight, eight and a half uh, years yeah long time um, it actually weirdly um, my business partner and myself um, I'm a friend of his mum's his mum was a customer of mine and we met and we just seen this unit and we're like why don't we do this and yeah, that's what's led us there. And it was it was dilapidated. It was really bad. But the bakery is in, so the back of where the bakery actually is, is in a railway arch. So we have a beautiful arch behind the scenes that you can't really see from the front of the house. But we're fortunate enough now with a little bit of expansion that we're in the process of doing, we're going to be able to bring the bakery out front. So we'll see a lot more coming to Bread for, to 41 oh, wow. Pier Street. Yeah, we're going to, we're, we're going after it. And you said you have 24 at the moment. Yes. For a startup, that is fan bloody tastic. Yeah. And you also whispered in my ear that you might be hiring more. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll be looking to take on uh, roughly six to seven more pending with social distancing and, and what we can do. This During is COVID. Yeah, That's well, it, we, we make the decision, put the head down and, and go for gold. you've seen the queues out the window for this arch, <laughs> he's, 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 he's been humble here. Like, <laughs> it goes right around the corner. People are literally queuing up for this bread and croissants and yeah, everything yeah. else. So what is the secret? I mean, if Jamie or I set up tomorrow morning, what would we be doing wrong that you're doing so right? Um, well, God, that's that's a tough question, but I think uh, like uh, we make everything from scratch. So the the key for us is everything we do, we do on site. We're super connected to the people behind the produce. So when that comes out of the kitchen, we always organic, always local, always seasonal. So there's their values. When you say local, there's no yeah. local uh, flour miller in the Dublin there's, area. There's a fabulous lady from Kildare milling grain in Kilkenny who drops it to you anytime you want it. Um, Oak Forest Mills, um, beautiful organic Irish spelt. And yeah, there is. You got to look for them. And your salt. 
Um, salt is at the moment, yes, salt's a good one. Salt's a tricky one. So <laughs> there is salt over an ackle, actually. Yes, the ackle sea salt, I know them well. <laughs> am, I, am I a pretty face? <laughs> <laughs> I hear it. Yeah, we work with lots of lots of um some to be genuinely honest, some of them um can't reach the demand of salt we use. That like our bread doesn't contain a lot of salt, but we would use Just anywhere from two and a half to three ton of flour a week. Okay. 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 So that's a volume. And that is probably a constraint as well in the middle. Or to longer term, like, you're, are you going to take on the world? Well, that's that's the question I was going to have you, for you was in terms of having that, um, being a specialist, yeah. for want of a better word, um, has getting, gotten the kind of competitive advantage for you. Okay. What do you, what do you think is going to maintain that for you going forward? Because I know you do, you do more than just loaves of bread. You yeah. Do unbelievable different sorts of pastries and, and that, and pies, by the way. Yeah. Pies unbelievable. <laughs> um, I was one of those people getting delivery to my after this one. It's yeah. not pretty. But yeah. um, that's why I have to train so much because I eat so much. Um, what is the what do you see as your competitive advantage going forward that you can maintain? Um I actually I think competitively it's it, it's just wholesome food, really, really simple. I think um I think I think we need more bakeries. We need more real bread produced. Um we had a wonderful story out today about a wonderful sandwich company out there who've been claiming they are putting something on something and it's not even bread. Yeah. And that actually genuinely would very, very closely run to a lot of industrial pans that we've been eating for a long period of time. And um, we have three ingredients versus their 37 ingredients. So as someone who eats a lot and, and is into their, their health, you got to ask what them 34 mm. ingredients are, you know, and stop and take time. And that's what would be competitive about it. And I'm, it's tough going. <laughs> I'm still waiting to hear about your world domination. How can you go for world domination or can you? Or are you just happy? You um, know, yeah, I'm super slice, happy. Yeah, I'm slice super, of the pie. Yeah, slice of the pie. There you go. I'm super happy the way <laughs> things are going. Um, we have a couple of nice little concepts coming up over the next couple of months. I don't want to tell you too much now. Go on, and, you're um, on Team GPS. And, <laughs> we're part of you. We're with you. Um, well, we're in expansion at the moment. We're expanding at the moment. So as I said, we're we're taking on about another 2,500, 3,000 square feet. And that's up and coming in the next, um, in the, hopefully in the next six to eight weeks. So if you, let's say you just scale, like just hypothetically, let's say you scale units and there's a Bread for I don't know if you can call yeah. it bread forty one and bread seven bread nine yeah. bread twelve no it's there it's there uh, <laughs> you go to Galway you go to yeah. Cork you go to Limerick yeah you go to Belfast and mm. um, Athlone all these different cities around around Ireland and um, if you're doing local how local do you get then when it comes to the product to stay true to yourself or is it the island you mean well I I definitely think in, in terms of, in terms of local that the, the trick would all be if we did say go to Galway in the mm. morning it would be a bakery there. You couldn't just decide to bake bread in Dublin, wrap it, put it in a van and bring yeah. it there to a shop because the bones of any good restaurant or any good food is from scratch. So when you walk in, in essence, you smell the bread, you, you know it's made there. You can say to the guy behind the counter, who made the bread, what's in the bread? And it's it's not what we buy the bread from here. It would be very easy for me to just put the bakery out in the middle of an industrial estate and anywhere and just wrap bread and sell it. But like, what do you stand for? Where does it come from? Where can I get the critique? Who keeps me in line? You know, I need that everyday customer that walks in and goes, I had your bread yesterday. Do you know what? It was a little bit dark. It was a little bit, I didn't like it. And then I go, okay, sorry about that. And I can fix that problem. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's staying close to the product and close to what we do. Um, and being able to say, right, they didn't like that. Why didn't like it? Maybe it's flavor and try educate them. Everything will lead back to education and saying, well, actually, it was meant to taste like that. Or have you tried this bread with this dish? And like bread, like you look at bread anywhere in the world, it's it's on every table. It just comes in different shapes and sizes. So that's the the model for me. And is, would, would you have an overarching purpose? Um, definitely, yeah, one hundred percent. When was the so? Did you sit down at the table with the whole family, break open that loaf of bread? And just there's a substance to it. There's like, it brings you back for me. Like when I make bread or put bread in the oven or take bread out of the oven, I still get that. I want to get up and make bread in the morning. Now, my better half and my two wonderful kids sometimes go, is dad making breakfast today? And he's not, he's in the bakery. I'll bring home the warm croissants. <laughs> so um, yeah, it's just the, 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 the purpose and what we do is, it's really simple. It just takes a lot of work. Yeah. Fantastic. Great story. Two years old. Two years old. Continued success. Thank you so much. That is Owen Klusky of A Bread 41. That great business show.com is brought to you by De Facto Shaving Oil. The best anyone can get. Made in Ireland, sold worldwide. We're sticking with bread on thatgreatbusinessshow.com now because during the week there was a lot of talk in business circles about an intriguing VAT tax ruling by our learned friends in the Supreme Court. A franchisee of the well-known brand Subway 
argued that it shouldn't be liable to VAT on certain of its takeaway products, including teas, coffees, and heated filled sandwiches. Now, I can't imagine that our finest judges are overly familiar with the Subway's famous meatball marinara, but they did enough research to decide that based on the amount of sugar in the Subway bread, they were not worthy of VAT-free status as defined in the VAT Act of 1972. We needed a VAT expert to tell Team GBS more about this and other VAT-related anomalies, so we called up Nora Collender, who has the wonderful title of Professional Tax Leader at Chartered Accountants Ireland. Welcome to That Great Business Show, Nora. Thank you very much, Carl. Nora, how many years have you been enjoying talking about that? I have not enjoyed a minute of it, I can assure you. Uh, I've been working in tax for about 20 years and there's no getting away from that, unfortunately, when you work in tax. It's highly complex and yet you have to get your head around it. And we had a chat on the phone and you gave me one simple uh, example of that and the anomalies, and there are many. So talk to me about tea. Okay, well, it all depends how you like your tea. If you go into your supermarket and buy a nice box of tea, that is zero rated. So you're not going to incur VAT on that because it's viewed as an essential foodstuff. If you go and enjoy it, tea and coffee. You live in Ireland, (laughs) Jamie. You're probably... Essential (laughs) though, is a bit much, isn't it? Vitamins or whatever whatever you drink. (laughs) It's a staple, okay? Rather than perhaps essential. It's not a legal term. It's it's just a Nora term for how I I like... I get through the day, so I need my tea. (laughs) So if I have it in dry format, if I purchase it dry, then it's zero rated. If I go to my local coffee shop, then I will have to incur a liability or a charge on it of 13.5%. So that's known as the reduced rate of VAT, believe it or not. And then the standard rate of VAT, if I want to enjoy my tea as a cold drink from my local shop, then that is actually classified as a soft drink with tea flavouring. And the VAT on that is 21%. And that's basically what happened with the Subway is they decided that the Hold on a second. So if... if, (laughs) If I made a cup of tea and I cooled it down and gave it to you with ice, well, how is that? Is that iced tea then? Well, are, are, you, are you selling it to me? Yeah. You're selling it to me. Well, if it's in your supermarket and it's flavoured, that's that's how, let's say, a lot of, I'm not going to use any brand products, yeah. but the ones that you would have in your supermarket. Now, if I'm in a shop and someone makes their homemade tea, well, that potentially is 13.5% because I'm consuming it on the premises of a cafe or a restaurant. And that's like a service. It's okay, a service. Right. So it's a different, it's a different product. So you have to, you have to look at how it's consumed, what's done to it and where you consume it. Now, you hold on there, Jimmy. Jimmy. My head's already exploded here. Oh, Jaffa Cakes. Wait till you hear about Jaffa Cakes. Yes, well, Jaffa Cakes has been the, the only laugh that anybody working in VAT has, <laughs> to be honest with you, over the last number of years. So this was a famous case back in 1991 where McVitie's took on uh, the UK court system and the HMRC, the, the, the UK revenue, and their view was that Jaffa Cakes were actually a cake and therefore they were subject to a lower rate of VAT than a biscuit because a biscuit with chocolate on top and it's only if the chocolate is on top, is subject to a higher rate of VAT. Now, there was all sorts of tests that were applied to establishing whether, in fact, it was a cake or a biscuit. And it came down to such a test as if the Jaffa cake goes off, the Jaffa cake actually goes hard like a cake would. Whereas your normal biscuit, if the biscuit goes off, then actually that goes soft. So the fact that the Jaffa cake went off in the similar manner They must have had some crack putting this together. (laughs) No, it's it's, it's the way it is. And as a result, it's the same in Ireland. So does the chocolate have to be on top? The chocolate has to be on top. So what happens if it's on, like there's ones that have on the bottom? If you have a chocolate chip, well then it's not going to be subject to the same rate of VAT. So literally, if you, you open a pack of biscuits and there's chocolate on top, there's a different VAT if you open those pack biscuits and the chocolate's on the bottom of the biscuit. If the chocolate's in the biscuit. Okay. Because I could turn a biscuit upside down. Exactly. I could say that's on top. But if, if, the, if it's a chocolate chip, then it's potentially part of the ingredients. And therefore, a chocolate chip biscuit has a lower rate of VAT than okay. a biscuit with chocolate on top. You never knew that was this exciting. Well, okay, you know what? Yeah, it kind of <laughs> is funny. Give me, give me your top five mad ones. Well, the Jaffa cake one I thought would blow that, your mind yeah. there. Candles, and talk to me candles, about candles. Yes, I love this indeed. One. Yeah, uh, a number of years ago, an unfortunate business had uh, had VAT 
refund stopped by revenue. And it went to the appeal commissioner, who would be the, the body that would independently review a tax dispute between revenue and a business. So the the tax legislation actually says that if you have a candle that's a nightlight, that's white or cylinder in shape, well, then that is subject to zero rate VAT. However, if the v, if the candle has a shape or a spiral or a decoration or a scent, well, then that's subject to the top rate of VAT, the okay. standard rate of VAT. So, which is normally 23%, which has been provisionally dropped down to 21%. But at the time, this taxpayer had to uh, deal with a VAT liability. Is that because... Is that because of church? No, it is all back to how VAT is originally drafted and the rules and regulations from it. And that emanates from the European Commission. It is it is a European tax. Okay. So every state is bound by European legislation, the VAT directive. And that's put together through years of case law, years of consideration of the basis, the necessity for a particular product or an item, or just really how it was when VAT law was just how it all w- came about was was there at the time. So maybe they didn't realise there would be a huge market in scented candles when they were originally putting uh, the VAT law together in the European Commission. Well, However, Ireland has to apply it as per the European Commission. And if you go into your Dunn stores or wherever and you see various candles and they look very similar, should the white one be a little cheaper than the purple one? They should, possibly, depending on how the actual Hmm. retailer wishes to deal with the cost of the vat. I think I know what you're saying. What we're saying here is if they have a white round candle and a purple round candle and they're charging the same, they're making more margin on the white one, yeah? Potentially, yes. I think that's a yes. <laughs> I, can o- I can only think from a VAT perspective rather than a retail margin okay, perspective. Fair. They're paying less VAT on the white one. They could, yes, exactly. Car parking. Yeah, car parking can be a strange one as well. So if you are parking your car on the street and you go to your little machine or you, you go online and you tap in, uh, you actually will not be paying any VAT on that charge. But if you if you park in a multi-storey car park, for example, then you will incur VAT on that. I, oh, I know, who you're, knows? You're still, you're but I ask, could say yeah. that the, the car parking on street is to do with traffic management. So that, that's the service that's been provided there. While as the traffic, when you park in a, a multi-storey car park, the service that's being consumed there is an actual use of space for your car. My learned friends would say if you're providing a service, that should have been at 13.5% VAT, shouldn't it? Uh, it could be, but it's it's different when it comes to anything to do with property, to do with actual physical space. That in itself can throw up a different interpretation. Yeah. There you go now. I told you, VAT is a nightmare. Well, but here's an interesting... Yeah, give me another random one. One. Well, this is actually quite serious. Mountain rescue equipment. Sure, yes. Uh, The Mountain Rescue uh, Front Group there for Ireland uh, would have been very, very strong in the media a number of years ago where they weren't getting a VAT refund on the equipment, the the essential equipment that they were using in their Mountain Rescue. So there was Kerry Mountain Rescue and Galway Mountain Rescue and and various Mountain Rescue agencies from all over the country uh, launched a very well-run public campaign on this matter. And their big issue was that if they were a a, a sea or inland water rescue group, well, they would have got a VAT refund on their equipment. So there was an anomaly there, which is is the theme of of today. And this was a very serious anomaly. Now, there was a really valiant campaign done, as I said, and it did go and it was posed in the European Parliament on a number of occasions. But again, it was something that was always there in the European VAT uh, legislation. What's, What's the difference? Well, the difference is that the lifeboats when well, when, the, when you purchase a lifeboat, you can get a refund for the VAT that's incurred on the lifeboat. Whereas for the mountain rescue groups, they weren't getting a VAT refund, let's say for their uh, their, their four by four yeah. or for their specialist equipment or for the training they were doing. Now, the matter was remedied to some extent when the government introduced a VAT compensation scheme for uh, charities. They did that in 2018. Now they've capped that at 5 million 
So it's up to all the charities in Ireland to put in their claims of their VAT expenditure. And last year alone, that added up to 50 million. Whoa. So as you can see, the the, the VAT uh, the VAT cap of 5 million on the scheme is, is very much short. Whoa. And the most they could get back is about What's 10%. What's the fundamental difference between a boat and a 4x4 four four for the boat? <sighs> yeah, absolutely. No, I totally agree. It doesn't make any sense. And this was brought before the European Parliament. But it was the way that the, the, the legislation was originally drafted in European law way back in the day when it was being uh, first put together and there was no changing it because there was a whole plethora of of issues for VAT and charities that it was going to implement and I I know the Minister for Finance at the time Michael Noonan did state that was the reason that they couldn't change the valiant uh, point that the mountain rescue groups were making because that would have a knock-on impact for all the other charities and their answer then was to have a club together fund of 5 million which, as I've, I've said there, it does fall short of the actual fat expenditure. <laughs> by, by 45 million. <laughs> Indeed, Just yeah. a touch. Yeah. So it's it's allowed pro rata across no, them all at about 10%. I'm not the yeah. answer to this, but because you've just made me think at this point about uh, if, all of these VAT rates are coming from Europe. Sorry, the VAT rules are coming from Europe. There are different VAT rates right across Europe. Yes. So we make up our own rate just to make, pay for government services. That but, could be some of it. But there's no reason why 13.5% is 9, which it has been, or mm-hmm. 2 or 5 or 6 or 9 or 3 or 4. Well, there are, um, let's say, a band of rates that you have to work within according to European rules. So let's say the standard rate, which is the equivalent of the top rate here of 21%, that can't be, that can't go any lower than 15%. And the, the reduced rate, which is the equivalent of 13.5% here, that can't go any lower than 5%. So the governments have to work within those bands. And essentially VAT is a revenue raising tax. So it's there to contribute to the economy and the exchequer. Like it it accounted for 25% of all tax raised in Ireland last year. That was 15 billion out of the 58 billion that was raised. And we're really feeling the pinch now at Mm. the moment because consumption obviously uh, has dropped. Uh, People are are saving their shekels. They're, Mm. They're worried about spending. So they've pulled back on spending. And as a result, then the VAT, um, refunds or the VAT, the VAT amount that's going into the exchequer has reduced. And that's why the government dropped the top rate from 23% to 21% for the next six months in an effort to try to encourage consumer spending again. If you were to make one small or large change to VAT in this country, what would you choose? Okay, that is a very tricky one. But I have to say that it's really important with my Brexit hat on that the Irish government introduces a measure called a deferred method of accounting for VAT. So what this essentially means is when uh, the uh, UK is is finalised, finished, done and dusted with the uh, European Union, well, then they're going to be a third country for VAT purposes. So anybody, uh, any Irish trader that's importing goods from the UK, they're going to have a, an upfront VAT cost because they're going to have to pay VAT on the import of the goods. Whereas if they're allowed to continue on under the, the EU rules, then the VAT is deferred till the time that they're actually charging money for the VAT. So you offset the VAT cost against the VAT that you're, that you're charging on. So you're reducing the, the cash flow uh, uh, cost for, for the trader. And that has been addressed in terms of an old deal, deal Brexit, but now we're faced with a situation where yeah. we're going to have a bad deal Brexit. So that needs to be addressed. More work for the accountants, isn't that uh, right? <laughs> it? It never gets easy. <laughs> that is Nora Callender, professional tax leader. I like that title. At Chartered Accountants Ireland. Thank you so much, Nora, for coming in. Thanks tonight. very much, Jamie. Thanks, Colin. Oh, so and, insightful, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and that is it from the second edition of That Great Business Show. A big thank you, as usual, to Peter Rice of Dublin South FM Podcast Studios. Peter makes us all sound on, extraordinary. Peter. And thanks to Sarah Bone at Enterprise Ireland for helping with arrangements. And a big shout out to some of our worldwide marketing team. That's African Australia, Isolt in Brooklyn, New York. And thanks to the followers we got in the UK, the US, South Africa. And there's even a guy. Uh, who's got a PhD, I won't name him, in Eindhoven in the Netherlands who told me that he cycles around listening to the podcast. You're not meant to cycle with the podcast going, but anyway, that's a different story. Our ask is simple. Tell your friends in business about us and tell them to subscribe to that great business show. Com. Finally, a big thank you to my co-host, Jamie Heaslip. So from myself and Jamie, thanks for listening. Take care.